And so there were times where I was just like, uh, my lungs are on fire. My legs are on fire. I can't, I'm like, dude, I don't want to work this hard. Like no one else is working this hard, but I wanted to be in this boat crew and I wanted to be a winner and I wanted to suffer in the front. And I'm like, okay, well, this is your time to suffer in the front. So let's go. So even though I was feeling bad, I would still push through that pain. And then at some point, other guys in the boat crew, they would have the same pain and like feel a little bit sorry for themselves. But now I've kind of recovered from, from my suffering and I'm like, okay, let's keep going. And, and we would always get in the front. And so like, these are two decisions you have in, in buds. You can either quit or keep going. And if you keep going, you can either be mediocre or you can be awesome. Welcome visionaries, creators, innovators, entrepreneurs, leaders, and growth seekers of all types to the Passion Struck Podcast. Hi, I'm John Miles, a peak performance coach, multi-industry CEO, Navy veteran, and entrepreneur on a mission to make passion go viral for millions worldwide. And each week I do so by sharing with you an inspirational message and in interviewing high achievers from all walks of life to unlock their secrets and lessons to becoming passion struck. The purpose of our show is to serve you, the listener, by giving you tips, tasks, and activities you can use to achieve peak performance and pursue the passion-driven life you have always wanted to have. Now, let's become passion struck. Welcome to episode 67 of the Passion Struck Podcast with retired Navy SEAL, William Branham. William's episode marks the last in our series of seven that have been dedicated to veterans who have served during the 20 year war on terror. These episodes include the Black Hall Racing Team, NASCAR Xfinity driver, Jesse Ouija, astronauts, Kayla Barron and Wendy Lawrence, and Navy SEALs, Dan O'Shea, Mark Devine, and Dr. Robert Adams. If you haven't had a chance to check them out, there is some amazing content and lessons to be learned. Also, I wanted to thank you for helping us surpass 100,000 downloads of the podcast and achieving over 1,400 five-star ratings. Navy SEAL Marcus Luttrell said, there's a storm inside of us, a burning river, a drive. You push yourself further than anyone would think possible. You are never out of the fight. And I use that to lead into today's episode with Navy SEAL sniper, William Branham. Now let me tell you a little bit more about William. He is a retired Navy SEAL with over 26 years of service. He led major combat operations, ranging from protecting the interim Iraqi officials to direct action missions in Baghdad and also across Amber province. After retiring from the military in 2018, he realized that he was suffering from both physical and psychological symptoms that were negatively impacting his well-being and quality of life. Like so many others, he used alcohol and prescription drugs to mask the symptoms that he had. Then he discovered CBD and it changed his life. It had such an amazing impact on his life that he started Naked Warrior Recovery to bring the highest quality CBD products to the market. And during our discussion today, we discuss his path to becoming a Navy SEAL, and it's a very unique one that you're not gonna wanna miss. The biggest lessons that he learned during his 26 years of being a SEAL, we talk about ODRs and their impact both to a business or to your personal life, and we will get into the definition of what an ODR is, the importance of humility in getting rid of ego, the importance in life of transitions, and why when we lose sight of those transitions, it can have such a lasting impact on whether we achieve success or failure, and so much more. Now, let's become passion struck. William, I am so happy to have you on the Passion Struck podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me here. I'm, I'm stoked to be here. Very excited. Well, you are the last episode that I'm doing for the month of September, and it's an honor of people like yourself who served during the War on Terror, and thank you very much for that service. But prior to you coming on, you were mentioning a mutual friend of ours, Chris Cassidy, and preceding you are actually two interviews with one former astronaut, uh, Captain Wendy Lawrence, and a current astronaut, uh, Kayla Barron. So that's cool. Very cool. <laughs> Very like cool. I said, I've, I've worked, I've been fortunate enough to work with two of the three SEAL astronauts that there are, Bill Shepard and, and Chris Cassidy. I've never worked with Johnny Kim, but there's, there's always time. So I can like 
put that feather in my cap as well, maybe one day. Yes. Well, I always like to hear origin stories of why someone wants to put themselves through buds and do what you did for a career. And you have a very interesting story that I think the listeners are going to love. And I was just in awe when I heard about it, because when I was in, and especially when I was junior, flag officers were intimidating. And so I'll just use that as a lead in uh, for you to tell your story. So I joined the Navy really as a, as a young enlisted guy. I grew up in Meridian, Mississippi, hunting and as a Boy Scout. I was an Eagle Scout. And so I always wanted to be some sort of something commando. I didn't know that word really, I don't think, back then uh, in, the, in the military. I, didn't, I knew I didn't want to be part of like the big army or the big military. I wanted to be part of a small special forces kind of group because I, I grew up watching Kung Fu Theater, which made me also want to be a ninja. And I'm still working on trying to become a ninja. But I watched John Wayne in the, in the movie Green Berets. I watched Chuck Norris in the movie Delta Force. And I watched John Rambo. Those were kind of the people I looked up to. And I eventually joined the Navy because someone said the Navy SEALs are the best. And I joined the Navy to become a SEAL. And then while I was going through the, the pipeline of boot camp and A school and things like that, I made some tactical errors that landed me on a ship in Yokosuka, Japan for 24 months. And when it was time for me to, to leave the ship, I called my detailer, the guy that says, hey, we need you to go to this next job or this next job. And I said, hey, hey, detailer, chief gunner's mate, chief so-and-so, I'm going to put a package in to go to SEAL training. And he said, that's great that you want to be a Navy SEAL, but we're not going to let you go because you're too critical. I was working on a system called VLS, Vertical Launch System, and it was the, the newest missile launching system in the Navy. And the Navy doesn't care at the time about anything other than what their requirements are for filling those jobs. And he says, you're too critical to the Navy, and I'm not going to let you go. So I didn't take no for an answer. I just I just took it as no right now. So I continued on. I passed. I finally passed the SEAL screening test, which I failed early on in my Navy career in boot camp. I passed the, the SEAL screening test. I did all the medical stuff. I got letters of recommendation. I did everything that I needed to. But again, I'm on a I'm on a, on a ship, little ship in Yokosuka, Japan. So there's not a lot of resources out there. There was a SEAL 05 on a ship out there as a, as an LNO. He wrote a letter of recommendation. And still, my detailer said, no, the Navy, uh, the SEAL detailers were like, your, your detailer has to release you. So uh, the CNO, Chief of Naval Operations, the most senior guy in the Navy, came to Yokosuka, Japan one day, and we knew he was coming. And people were like, everyone on my ship knew that I wanted to be a SEAL. I made it pretty apparent to most people. And they're like, why don't you, why don't you ask the CNO if he'll let you go to BUDS? And I am just a dumb junior enlisted guy. I was an E4 trying to make E5 and I didn't, I mean, I knew that, you know, stars meant something, but I really didn't know like the gravity, the power of like what these people have. And, and they're like, this guy, he was a common sense leader when he was in charge of Bupers and all these other places for decision-making people were like, Hey, this is a common sense solution for a problem that we don't really have. And he's like, hey, okay, let's change that. So let's just say, for example, if you're overseas, you have to get another overseas screening to go to another job overseas. Like if you're in, J in Japan, you have to get another overseas screening, which is a big, long medical process. It's not like they're not going to send you but to the next job there in Japan, but you have to go through this whole big process. And he's like, really? That's a, that's a thing? If you're overseas, you have to get an overseas screening to stay overseas. That doesn't make any sense. Change. So he would ch make changes like that. And so he came to my ship. On, in Yokosuka, Japan, a small destroyer, one of the oldest at the time. And there were lots of other ships. And he didn't go to any other ship. He just he only came to our ship in Yokosuka, Japan. And he had CNO's call. And he talked about how his plans and visions and things. And I wasn't listening at all. I have no idea what he said. But then he asked, does anyone have any questions? And I raised my hand. I was like, yeah, I, I do. I joined the Navy to be a Navy SEAL. And my detailer won't let me go. I totally threw him under the bus. I think I deserve a chance to go. Maybe I make it, maybe I don't. But I think I deserve a chance to go. He turns to my commanding officer and he says, is he a good guy? I just happened to be the sailor of the quarter that quarter. And I think the thing that got me to become the sailor of the quarter is in the Navy, you, you get, now it's mandatory after I got mine, my ESWAS, my, my surface warfare pin as an E4. I, there were E6s and E7s that didn't have it. And I took so much pride in wearing that thing around as an E4. And that's really what really got me to be the sailor of the quarter. So he turns to my CO and he's like, hey, is he a good guy? He's like, yeah, he's a sailor of the quarter this quarter. He turns back to me and he's like, check, you'll be in the first class after your PRD. 
And I was like, awesome. And then after that, the master chief petty officer of the Navy came down after the CNO's call was over. He found me and he was like, okay, name, name and, uh, and social. He's like, the easy part's done. Now the rest is up to you. I tried it. It wasn't for me. And I was like, wow, you've been to buds too. And so I, I was like, oh, that's awesome. And I didn't really understand at the time, the gravity of like who I was actually talking to. I'm just like, that's a guy that's in charge of a bunch of stuff. <laughs> no one's going to yeah. like, but I talked to other, like I told my, my skipper that I was going to ask him and he was like, ask him. Like I let other people know. I didn't just like go straight to the top. I at least informed along the way before I went straight to the top. Well, I, that is an amazing story. I am not sure I would have had the courage if if I were in your same position to do what you did. But uh, you you I would think it's, you would if you wanted to do it, you definitely would have found the courage. Well, you never you been like, you know. It's just a man; doesn't matter. I've always heard that saying: "You never know unless you ask." And sometimes that's how I've gotten some of the best podcast guests is because you just asked them. Hundred percent. That in itself is a, a val- hugely valuable lesson that. I constantly remind myself of, I get stuck a lot of times. Like, I wish I could do this. I wish I could figure this out. I know the guy that has the answer. I oftentimes scared to ask him. (laughs) And then I have to like, and people are like, you're not scared of anything. You're a Navy SEAL. I got lots of fears that you just don't know about. But yeah, I like, I wanted that. Like I wanted that more than anything. I wanted to go to, to buds more than anything. And even if my skipper said no, I still probably would have asked the CNO. And if the CNO said no, I would have probably gone to my congressman and, uh, until I got to the end. But just if you see something and you want something, you have to go and work for it. And you have to not be afraid to ask for help. And that's, that was, that's something I still struggle with today is asking for help. Well, I think a lot of people do. I know I do, especially from people. And it sounds kind of crazy that I admire the most um, because I'm worried about using my ass up, A-S, A-S-K-S. Um, because yeah, yeah, yeah. there are only so many times you want to burden someone in my right. mind, but uh, you never know unless unless you pick up that phone or send them an email and and find out. The worst thing they're going to do is say no, so you might as well try. And it's amazing right. how many people don't do that. Right. And so here's a couple of examples for you. I have a couple of business coaches, and I was in California doing a podcast with one of them. And then while I was in California, I reached out to the other one and I was like, Hey, I'm in the area doing a podcast with this other guy. And I don't know if you're available today or tomorrow, maybe to get lunch or dinner or something. And he was like, you're in the area, stand by. And he put out an email to his, like, he's like, this guy's a billionaire. And he put in an email to his network. And he was like, Hey, dinner with a Navy SEAL. You need to have no less than 300 million net worth in order to sit at the table. And he like went out and found these people to come have dinner with me just that wanted to hang out. And like, and I was like, I was afraid to ask him. And he was like, it was my greatest honor to like have dinner with you and like share stories and and things like that. I was like, dude, I'm not anyone special. I'm just a regular job, regular guy. (laughs) That's, that's a great story. So it's, it's, it's interesting. Like people want you to succeed and you just don't even know it. You just have to ask for, you just ask for help, ask for, has to be someone's friend. It's fine. No, it's, it's a great point. Well, one of the things I always like to ask Navy SEALs who come on the show, and you're, you're the fourth one, is what is the biggest lesson that you learned from going through BUDS? I think the one that no one else really shares, it's better to suffer in the front than suffer in the back. And what I mean by that is if you're going to do something, and it's probably going to be something that's hard, you're going to suffer. There's no way to get around that. It's going to be hard. You're going to suffer. And the analogy that I like to use is during Hell Week, I was part of a boat crew that we won almost every single race. And in Buds, everything is a race. It pays to be a winner. That is a, a slogan for a reason because it does. It pays to be a winner. And I ended up in a boat crew on purpose because I like I saw them winning in the beginning of Hell Week. And the boat crew I was in had some really good guys but they weren't driven to be at the front. They weren't driven to win the race. And a lot of those guys quit and enough people in the class quit by Monday, late Monday afternoon before dinner. I saw this other boat crew, boat crew three winning all these races. And then they had to reshuffle boat crews because there were like four, four guys in this boat crew and five in here. And really it's, it's a seven man boat crew. And so I was like, I'm going to get into boat crew three. And so they, they lined us all up in a height line and I counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, I'm number five, six, seven. So for the rest of Hell Week, I always made sure no matter how many times we reshuffled boats, I was in that boat crew because the guys that were in there, there was no one that was like a superstar. Everyone was average. 
but they all had the desire to suffer in the front. No one talked about it. We just did it. And so it didn't matter what boat crew, what, where we started when we like have these boats on our head and we're walking to, maybe we're going to, to chow, we're going to dinner, or we're going to, you know, go get in the ocean and paddle out and come back. It didn't matter what we were doing, log PT, running down the beach. We always, if we started in the back, if there was a gap with any boats in front, we would run and sprint and put out more effort to get in front of the boat crews that were in front of us if they, if they left the gap. And we would do that until we got to the front. And so there were times where I was just like, <sighs> like my lungs are on fire, my legs are on fire. I can't, I'm like, dude, I don't wanna work this hard. Like no one else was working this hard, but I wanted to be in this boat crew and I wanted to be a winner and I wanted to suffer in the front. And I'm like, okay, well, this is your time to suffer in the front. So let's go. So even though I was feeling bad, I would still push through that pain. And then at some point, other guys in the boat crew, they would have the same pain and like feel a little bit sorry for themselves. But now I've kind of recovered from, from my suffering and I'm like, okay, let's keep going. And, and we would always get in the front. And so like, these are two decisions you have in, in buds. You can either quit or keep going. And if you keep going, you can either be mediocre or you can be awesome. And so I chose to be awesome. I chose to be with a, an awesome group of people. And it kind of goes to that, you know, the, the five people that you surround yourself. Well, I had six other people that I surrounded myself and we always made our way to the front. And so when I looked back on that lesson, I'm like, you, we, buds sucks physically. Uh, you know, you're going to suffer. Everyone suffers. It doesn't matter who you are or what you're doing, but it was always better to suffer in the front because that was always a win. You got these little micro wins. Like we, we won. And it didn't matter, like, you're still going to do the same evolutions, you're still going to do the same work that everyone else does. But it was always just a little bit better to finish in the front than it was in the back. I think that's a great story. I asked Chris Cassidy, I'll, I'll just bring him up one more time, the same question. And his answer was that trying times end. And he told me uh, the story. He's much that, uh, smarter than I am. He's <laughs> more full. He just said that he remembers it vividly that um, he was just freezing, was just miserable, but he looked over and there happened to be a, a Thai officer who was going through buds at the time with him. And he goes, as uncomfortable as he was, he goes, this guy was just jackhammering and was just in complete despair. And he's like, if he, if he's not going to give up, there's no way in heck I'm going to give up. So he just said, you know, I would focus on taking the actions to get to the next action. And he goes, you can't, it, it taught me that, you know, you might have a mission that you've got to accomplish, but you've got to break it up into the steps and just concentrate on being present and getting the next one done. And I think that and what you said have a lot of common uh, elements to both of them. And, um, and I, I have another analogy that I kind of use and I referenced Hell Week, you know, when we talk about this right here a little bit later on, is that the key to Hell Week is to, to achieve these small victories. But what you always know is they feed you four times a day. So it doesn't matter how much it sucks, how miserable it is, how all you got to do is make it to that next meal. And every time you make it to that next meal, that you, you won. Like they couldn't break you there. All you got to do is make it to that next meal. And you just have to do that four times a day. And, you know, if you have like projects or things that you're working on, you've got suffering in life, you just make it to that next meal and then just keep going like that. Very good point. Well, I wanted to, to talk to you a little bit about transitions and I'll lead into this. Um, I heard you on another podcast talk about this and I thought it made a ton of sense to me because the motto of the show is you got to make a choice. You've got to do the work every day and you got to step into your sharp edges. And to me, transitions are those periods when you're not expecting yourself to be on full alert. It's like if you're on a combat mission, it's like getting to the point that your objective is or getting out. And prior to the show, we talked about it a little bit, but my own experience is that is when things get the most screwed up sometimes is because you're not on guard, you're not charging through. And I think people do that in life too. They, they're not taking matters of that transition, which is kind of going through the motions of their everyday life. So I was hoping you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go kind of around and, and come back to it. So someone asked me this question once upon a time. And, you know, what I, what I equated it to was, in, in really the, the question was about mission planning. Like, what, do you, what steps do you do for mission planning? And, you know, so there's the mission, which is like the thing that you're going to go do. And then there's the planning piece of it where you kind of, 
like as a leader, you, you have the overall plan, but you assign, you know, people different pieces of the plan and then you brief the plan. And then the people who are in charge of those pieces of the plan, they brief their portion of it so that everyone gets to see it. And then the most important part before you even go on the mission. And I, and I learned this kind of the hard way because we had some, the missions didn't go catastrophically wrong, but there was like, how is this so jacked up right now? This seems to be the easiest part. And what we learned was really doing a dirt dive or doing practicing the transitions were the most important part of, of the mission planning. And what I mean by that is, so let's just say you're, you're driving into a target And you transition from being on base to out into like bad guy world. So there's a transition there. So you went from like good guy land to bad guy land. Now you're on head. Now you stop and you get out and you patrol to the target. You walk to the target. Well, that that transition of getting out of the vehicles and then walking, patrolling to the target, like you have to like, there's a bunch of stuff that goes on, like get in line, get in a certain order, get in your like from like the, the point man all the way back to rear security and where you're supposed to be, because that's how kind of how you trained. So that you have, you know, everyone is there. Everyone has the equipment before we get to the target, get to the target. We already know what our actions on are. Those are kind of dictated on what happens when we get there. Do we need to breach it? Are we going to be a soft breach? What happens in that? Like we practice that part of it really, really well. But then like the part of like, when we're done with the target and getting a head count before we get back to transition back into the vehicles, like you have to make that to the, the most simple way possible. Cause you're all jacked up and you're like chaos everywhere. Okay. Let's break it down into something simple. Like, okay, squad one, get in a line squad. Like everyone just get in a line. And in me as a leader, and I go to each squad leader or fire team leader and I'm like, head count. Are you good? Like, you know, And then we practice those transitions and then the transition to get back in the vehicle. Like we don't need to practice like what we're going to do when we're in the house or in the building or out in the field. We need to, we need to practice the things like before you get on the helicopter to make sure you have all the people that you have before you get back in the vehicles, before you leave the target, because there could be someone left inside those, those transition points. Like you have to practice those. And so most of us don't do that. Usually the transition, we're like, we did the hard stuff. We're going to go do the, like, we're going to just drive back home now or get in a helicopter and fly back home now. Like, those are the times when, like, the enemy is waiting for you. Okay, you're just kind of, like, lollygagging around at night somewhere, and then the enemy hits you. That's when the IED goes off. That's when, like, bad shit happens. And it's always during that transition when you're being, like, kind of lackadaisical. You're being, you're being complacent. And, you know, we all, you know, complacency kills because you're not locked on. You're not paying attention. And, you know, the same thing is true in, in life. It, you know, it happened to me when I, when I retired from the military, you know, I still say that the hardest military mission I've ever been on is when I went from retiring and becoming a civilian. I'm still like struggling through that mission because I didn't plan. I didn't practice that transition from, you know, having a mission every day, having a purpose, having a reason to get up, having, having a team. Like I went from like having a badass team, a badass mission, a badass purpose to, having none of that. And like, I wasn't prepared for that. And that rocked my world pretty good. Uh, now I have a, a mission. I have a team. I'm still building a team. I have a purpose. And uh, it, so, but I'm still working through that transition. And I didn't practice that mentally. I didn't practice it with other people and bring other people to kind of help help me dirt dive and, and, and work through that transition. So that's been something that I've struggled with. But I think that like the value of practicing the transition, practicing that dirt dive is really the most important part of of mission planning. That's great. And what advice would you give to a veteran who may be separating soon, or even maybe better yet, one who's just starting their service? Because I think oftentimes, like you you talked about, uh, when I got into the service, I wasn't thinking about my exit plan too much. And then when the time came, it's like it, it, went in the like almost like an instant and then like it it's like you're in the civilian world and right. I kind of had the same exact thing uh, that happened to me that happened to you so I always and I've heard talking to other veterans it hasn't gotten any better so what what advice since you're more recent to it than I was would you give veterans about that I knew that I was retiring I knew that like the navy's not going to like there's no special job that they need me to go to I knew that, you know, on that day, my, my, my time was up, but I was in denial. I was like, I, I still have purpose. I still have, like, I still bring value. I'm still providing value to the team, to the command. 
And I wasn't, I was only taking care of the team. I wasn't taking care of myself. And what this other lesson that I've learned throughout my naval career is if you don't take care of yourself, no one else is going to. And that's what, when you get out of the military, they don't care about you anymore. I still have friends that are active duty and things like that, but they don't have time for me. They're, they're busy. They're working. And so, and I understood that. And I remember when guys got out, I didn't have time for them either. Like, I'm like bro, you got your, you got to do, go do you. I've got to do me and take care of these people over here and, and this mission. And so I, I totally get it. But what I would say is, I would say at least two years out, start your mission planning for that transition. And no one wants to do it. Or maybe you are afraid that your supervisor, the people you're working for, working with, they're going to judge you for not focusing on the mission. They're like, you're still part of the Navy. You're part of the military. We still own you. And that's great. But you still need to, like, even in your, in your off time, like, just start looking and trying to figure out what you want to do next. Maybe it's some sort of vocational thing. Maybe it's entrepreneurship. Maybe you want to work for some Fortune 500 company as a, as a COO or something like that. You can do that, but start the planning process. And maybe not taking up your, your, your military day, but at night, just start planning, like figuring out, like start sending resumes out and seeing what, what's available out you out there for you. Reach out to nonprofits that help veterans transition, uh, help place veterans. I'm, I'm, uh, been part of two nonprofits that help veterans kind of transition into the workplace. Uh, one of them is more specific to special operations and sort of the, the fighter pilot community. And the other is just like all veterans. So, so yeah, I would start making that plan and start doing that dirt dive now. Like, you know, practice your interview skills, practice, like figure out, like, just because when you get out, you may land a job that may not, that's probably not going to be the job that you end at. So be prepared to shift and transition. And, and again, like kind of practice those Practice that mindset. It's a, a lot of it is a mindset as well. Like I went from having income and purpose and to like no income. And I thought I maybe had a purpose, but I failed many times. I started my own consulting company. And what I realized was people, the word consultant, a lot of companies don't like because other people have come before me and burned bridges because they're, they're like, oh, you're a consultant. We don't want to talk to you. We hate consultants. So I, that was like a branding thing. Like I didn't know that I had friends that are consultants and they're doing very well. I'm like, I, I'm going to do that as well. And then when I would talk to companies, they're like, yeah, sorry, beat it, beat it, bro. <laughs> Wait, but I have value. I, I swear <laughs> I do. Okay, well then go prove it. Go sell our widget. And, uh, and we're not going to pay you unless you have a, you know, create commission. What? So yeah, a lot of well, failures along the way. So I didn't, I didn't plan well enough and I certainly didn't dirt dive well enough. Did you know that Forbes magazine recently cited that 70% of individuals who do personal development masterminds and one-on-one -on -one coaching benefited from better work performance, increased communication skills, and overall better relationships. And we at PassionStruck are obsessed with self-development, coaching, and mentorship. That is why we've created a free resource to help you unlock your hidden potential. Because people doing great things in business and life are just like you, only they've had a coach along the way and we've got that covered too. Let us show you the systems and frameworks that we teach growth-minded individuals to help them step into their sharp edges, execute on their passion journeys, and get predictable results time and time again. Go to passionstruck.com coaching right now, and let's get igniting. I've recently talked to a couple uh, professional football players, and both of them played for long, periods time, 12, 13 years, but in each of their cases, they were unique because the average player only plays two to three years. And so for both of them, uh, as when they were in their rookie year, they started to think about what they wanted to do afterwards. And one of them wanted to get into real estate investments, et cetera. So he started just trying to reach out to every real estate developer he could find so he could learn. And I think that's what veterans could do too. You know, when, when you eventually are thinking about what you want to do once you get out, start making those connections today. Start looking at certifications. The sooner you start, the better. Yeah. Yeah. Start looking at certifications that the military might pay for. Could be agile, agile management. It could be PMP, something dealing with those PMP. Because one of the biggest things uh, that happened to me is that when I was in uh, total quality management was a huge thing. And so the Navy paid for me to become like 
master certified in total quality management. And I was only going to do one course. And my commanding officer is like, this is money for you down the down the road. So you really want to invest your time here. And she was You're right. going because, to invest your time. Yeah. <laughs> because it, it was the reason that uh, Booz Allen ended up hiring me. Is is because of the total quality management background that I had. So it's weird. Okay, Booze so, wouldn't ha- they wouldn't hire me for whatever reason. I don't know why. They never returned my phone calls. I could have helped you with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew like the number four or five guy there. Well, I want to jump to another topic, and this one, you know, as I was looking at at your bio and read it before we, you know, started this uh, this podcast, so the listeners and viewers will hear it. You were suffering from many of the same symptoms I was suffering from, things such as irritability, memory loss, concentration issues, migraines, down the line. And I wanted to bring it up because, you know, just today I got a phone call out of the blue from a veteran who I didn't know who happened to hear my podcast. And I think that there are a lot of people who have these symptoms and they think they're all alone and no one else is going through them. And I'm finding out more and more that, especially um, if you were in combat, if if you were a special operator, if you were a first responder, whatever it may be, a lot of people are facing these issues. And I just wanted to, I, I'll let you talk about it, then I can share my thoughts. But I, I want you to lead into how you found this link between CBD and it helping with many of those things that uh, we, we both have suffered from in the past. I don't generally talk about PTSD because it comes in all sorts of forms. What I usually say is we all have baggage. And again, baggage, the kind of think about it, maybe it's something that you experience in a work environment. Maybe it's something you experience through toxic relationships because lots of relationships end up being toxic. Maybe it's your fault. Maybe it's someone else's fault. Maybe it's no one's fault. It's just the way that it is. Certainly the way the media is today, it's they, they're they certainly trying to influence people to think a certain way with trying to put as much fear on you as possible. In my humble opinion, I don't watch the news because I, it bothers me because I have enough of my own baggage. And the way that I was dealing with it, with these, this noise in my head is I can't go to sleep at night. I've got too much stuff. It doesn't matter what time I get up in the morning when it's time to go to sleep. I can't go to sleep. I can't like turn it off. And so the, what I was doing is, you know, I was taking some pharmaceuticals to help dull it out. And I was drinking myself to sleep pretty much every night, you know, just glasses and glasses and glasses of vodka till I passed out more or less, and then have to get up in the morning and, and then perform. And so I was driving to work one day and listening to a podcast. It was probably 2016. And the guy was talking about uh, medical marijuana. And he was like, everyone knows about the molecule THC, but not very many people know about this other very medicinal molecule called CBD. People are using it for epilepsy. People are using it for chronic inflammation. It's helping people recover from other chronic illnesses. It reduces stress, anxiety. It helps people with pain. And, uh, and I was like, I I need, let me write that down CBD. And I never forgot that. And then over time, I would hear it more and more and more. And, but I wasn't going to go down the road of, of a marijuana product because I'm still in the military. I still maintain my top secret clearance and that's just not the way that I want to end my career through a, a failing a drug test. And so I, I retired in 2018 and actually CBD wasn't even still legal. It was still fringe. It was still fringe until December 20th of 2018 when Congress passed the farm bill, which made hemp legal. And then after that, CBD became legal. So I tried CBD for the first time in 2019, June ish of 2019. I was in Virginia. I was having lunch with a former teammate. And, and I said, when we were done, I was like, I'm going to go see if I can try to find some CBD because maybe what you have here in Virginia. And I didn't know that much about it in Virginia is better than what we have in Hawaii. And he's like, if you want CBD, I've got some at my house. He's kind of an Instagram influencer and some companies sent him some products. And uh, so I took it and I used it that night. And maybe I was a little less pissed off the next, I slept up maybe a little bit better that night and a little less pissed off the next morning. Maybe, maybe not. But what I noticed is after about 30 days, you know, I finished that bottle, I was less pissed off and I hurt less. And the way that I kind of, to kind of quantify it, it's hard to quantify in like one piece, but the way that I quantify that is water boils at 212 degrees. I was living at like 210 degrees. So my fuse was very short. It didn't take much to like go over that edge. 
And so over the, the 30 days or so of taking CBD, I went from like 210 to 205 to 200 to 195 to maybe 185. And so I just noticed that my fuse was, was longer. Like I still have the same triggers that like would piss me off and like send me into whatever fits that I would have, but it just took longer for me to get there. And so it, 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 it helped to quiet. And I noticed that I was drinking less also in order to go to sleep. So that was bonus, bonus. And thirdly, I had pains. I'm pretty beat up. And I was like the, the stabbing sharp pains that I just have been experiencing for years. They were less sharp. They were a little more dull. And so I ran out of CBD and then I you know, stopped taking it. And I started getting closer back to that, that boiling point. And, and, you know, some of the pains came back. So I tried another brand and I started coming back down. And so I'm like, maybe there's actually something to this. And so I started first, then I went to a business symposium and I really was interested in the CBD industry. And I'm like, I want to learn more about this. And I met a girl and who was the only person that I met at the, at that symposium that was in the CBD industry. Everyone else was like fitness professionals. And I'm like, Hey, you're the CBD girl, right? She's like, yeah. I'm like, I'm interested. And really, I wanted her to hire me so I could learn from her and learn about the industry and all this other stuff. And she was like, so do you want to do A to B, B to B, B to C? I'm like, I want to do CBD. I don't know what you're saying to me right now. And she was like, well, then why don't you just start your own company? And I'm like, I don't know how to do that. I'm a, I don't know how to do that. She's like, you're a Navy SEAL. Go figure it out. And I was like, all right, fine. Uh, can I have my man card back, please? And so she, you know, kind of gave me a little bit of insight into the industry. And then I started, at least she gave me a point to start. And then I started researching and I found out that most of the CBD industry is, is pretty corrupt. It's pretty dirty. It's cleaning up now, but it, you know, for the most part, people were just, let's get rich quick. And uh, the, you know, the FDA has done many spot checks where they found that 70% of the companies, more than 70% of the companies out there, either they didn't have CBD in them. They had high levels of, of THC outside the legal limit of 0.3% or less. They had high levels of, of heavy metals, uh, mercury, arsenic, lead, things like that. Uh, they had solvents. They had all sorts of other crap in, in the oil. And if you're going to put something into your body to be like a medicine, you don't want to be putting a bunch of poisons in your body. And it's, it's important. What I also found is it's important to have like good farming practices because hemp is a bioaccumulator, which means it pulls all the good stuff out of the soil and all the bad stuff out of the soil. And it's such a powerful bioaccumulator that they're using hemp at Chernobyl to clean the radiation out of the soil to hopefully maybe re go back and repopulate that area someday. And I'm pretty sure that you don't want to have some Chernobyl CBD. That's probably not going to be. <laughs> Man, it is amazing how close Chernobyl came from being so much more catastrophic than it was. Um, I read a few months ago that it was on the verge of creating a cloud that would have killed it was like wow tens tens of millions of people throughout uh, not only russia but uh some of the countries it borders as well so that is pretty remarkable that they're using hemp to to try to repopulate that area it's Something a super powerful plant and and you know and, and we've, been, we've been using it for thousands of years Humans have been using it for thousands of years as medicine, not really knowing how it works, but it certainly helped me. It helped me with migraines. I have way less migraines now than I used to. I less pain, a little bit more mental clarity. And because I've gotten, I still suffer. I still have problems. I still have TBIs. I still have other issues, other baggage, but CBD helped me to manage the pain a little bit better. It helped me manage this noise in my head a little bit better. So because the industry was so dirty, I went out and I found the highest quality suppliers that I could, and I've partnered with them. And I've still looked for, you know, high quality suppliers. No one is, produces a higher quality oil than the suppliers that I'm with right now. And I'm looking always. And the biggest names out there, no one, if you can think of a CBD brand, they probably don't, they're probably still not as high a quality as the suppliers that, that I am working with. And I can give you, I'm not saying that they're bad. But I'm saying that we go to levels of, of safety that they don't go to. Yeah. And if someone but, uh, is hearing this and they'd be interested in trying out your CBD, how can they how can they find it? I would go to my website, which is nw-recovery.com, or you can type in nakedwarriorrecovery.com, which will go to that website. But I made it not naked warrior recovery, only because some people may not want to put naked into their search engine. So nw dash recovery.com is uh, the best way to get to that, that website. Okay, great. Um, and I, I want to switch directions a little bit. So on a previous episode, I had a guest and we were talking about 
OKRs, which is something that uh, entrepreneurs use, it's objectives and key results. And I wanted to talk to you about ODRs. Um, so if the listener doesn't have a clue what an ODR is, um, can you enlighten them? An ODR, that's a great question. And uh, <laughs> an, an ODR is Operational Deficiency Report. Basically what it is, it is a, it's a process that we use in, in the SEAL teams, in Naval Special Warfare, to give the guys at the, at the deck plate level, and it can happen, it can come from anywhere in the chain of command, but really guys at the deck plate level who are trying to go do the work, if they have a deficiency that prevents them from getting the job done, or if a technology doesn't exist, they can basically write up, this is the deficiency, this is why, it important for us to solve this problem. This is the problem. This is a possible solution. And then they route that up the chain of command. It gets adjudicated at the highest levels and then it gets racked and stacked. Unfortunately, no money gets applied to it. But what it does, is it, it, at the very least, is it lets the, the leadership at the highest level understand the problems at the lowest level. You know, at the deck plate level. Maybe it's a, a TTP, tactics, techniques, procedure. Maybe it's an actual technology. And, you know, my last job in the Navy was I was the science and technology director for Naval Special Warfare Group 3. And my job was to go and solve the ODRs. And what I ended up doing is I went out and found $16 million of other people's money to solve these problems. I created technologies like a quantum cascading laser, some underwater communication technologies, some new kind of inflatable technologies to, to get our, our SEAL delivery vehicle out of hostile uh, waters via surface craft if for some reason it, it went down at, at high speed. Really challenging science, challenging the physics of things, challenging, really challenging the status quo. So if you, and it's something that you can probably do in your own life. If you have a problem, try to figure out a solution and then go and find people who may be able to help you solve that problem. And that's what I would do. I would go, I would have a problem, I would have a deficiency, and then I would go find people that, could potentially solve the problem. And then I would go find funding to put towards solving this problem, pay these people to help solve the problem and then create new technologies, create new things. And, uh, and so that was, that's kind of what an ODR is, I guess. Yeah, it sounds like it could be applied many different places. I know for many small business owners or entrepreneurs who might be listening to this episode, it would be a great tool that you could use if you're giving an assignment out for, to allow your team to come back with you with feedback on what do they, what tools do they need to properly do that mission that you're assigning them? Right. I mean, because the leader, leaders are looking up and out generally. They're not looking down and in. And so they don't really, they kind of know what's going on in the company, but they don't know the bumps and bruises. They don't know the challenges that, that their people are, are working through. And this gives them, uh, you know, the people at the lowest level, mid level, the ability to communicate without bitching to leadership, the like a formalized process to address issues that are challenging for, for you know, the, the people who are actually running the company, who are actually doing the work uh, to make their life easier and to let the leadership know, hey, this is a problem uh, that hopefully we can find a solution for. Well, that's great. Um, and I wanted to jump from that um, into one of the topics I heard you talk about in the past was fail fast, fail often. And oftentimes you're like, well, he's a Navy SEAL. What do you mean failure? SEALs don't fail. And I loved your explanation about it because I am a true believer that failure and the quicker that you fail makes you so much stronger. And someone who tells me they've never been through failure, I just laugh at because the biggest failures of my life prof professionally and personally have led to some of the biggest breakthroughs from the lessons learned. So I'd love to get your perspective on that. Right. And so the, the saying that I have there is, is accept failure and failure for me is like kind of what you said, it's been one of the biggest, greatest teachers of my life and the lessons that I've learned from failure. I wouldn't trade those, those lessons for any amount of money in the world because I have that experience now. And I don't always, maybe someone said, go do this like this. And maybe I kind of did, and maybe I kind of didn't, but I had to go and I had to do it my way and fail 
and then figure out what works best for me. And so I see failure as failure is a foundation for success because you go and you try something and you fail and you just, you, you built a little bit of a foundation. You try something again and you fail. And you and again, it's like a ladder. You're building a ladder, a staircase to, to climb over this obstacle that's in front of you. And then pretty soon you, you failed so many times, you're like, that's, now I know how to get over this obstacle. And you hop over it and you go to the next obstacle and you fail, fail, fail. And you've, you've got a bigger foundation. So you'll fail less further on down the road, but you have to create that failure. And to kind of put it into perspective, not specifically me, you know, talk about the most successful people in the world. You've got you know, Michael Jordan, the most successful greatest basketball player of all time. He's missed more than 9,000 shots in his career. He's lost more than 300 games. He's missed more than 26 game winning shots. You know what he did, what he would do, what he would do after every game where he missed a shot, like it didn't matter if they won, won or lost, he would go back and he would replay and he would practice that shot that he missed until he didn't miss it anymore. Until he like nuked that shot. And then that played into other parts of success. So whatever worked for that shot probably worked with this other shot. So, so he never missed that shot again, but he missed other shots. And so he would continue building on that. Uh, Thomas Edison, the guy who created the incandescent light bulb, he discovered more than 10,000 different ways to not create the incandescent light bulb. He didn't fail. Maybe he failed 10,000 times, but he kept going until he finally got it right. Steve Jobs and, and Elon Musk, both icons of business, both fired as CEOs of companies that they started. And then they learned, they created something else, they came back and they made their companies even better. So failure is, in, in my opinion, the, the foundation of success. So if someone says that they're not failing, that means they're not doing anything. They're not trying. They're living a mediocre life. And then you kind of have to kill the mediocrity in your life if you want to be successful at anything. And you have to try and you have to work and you have to fail. Yeah, I happened to hear an interview with Michael Jordan some time ago. And it was interesting because one of the biggest failures when he was a teenager led to some of his biggest success in life. And when he was a sophomore in high school, he didn't make the basketball team, if you can imagine that. Um, um, he, he wasn't picked. And so he was mad for a while, but he started to create the work ethic that defined him. And every day he would go to school at five o'clock in the morning. And before class, he'd play basketball for two, two and a half hours every single day. And he also did that uh, when he became a professional uh, and he would go to practice far in advance of his other teammates. He would get to the, the games hours in advance and just shoot hundreds of balls. And it's that work ethic, kind of like those transition points that doing that work, when you have those moments that really count, sometimes you're not going to make that game winning shot, but you're going to be a heck of a lot more confident taking it than if you don't do that work and stack those actions and do those failures that you talked about. 100%. So that, that's great. Getting, um, getting those reps in, just doing the reps. And that that builds the confidence that you need. That builds the, you know, the muscle memory. That builds continuing to do that work. That's, that's the key. Yes. And that's everything that uh, you guys did in the SEAL teams because you trained for, what, two years before you actually went out yeah. um, and did your deployments? Months. Yeah, 18 months. And, you know, most, not every mission, but most missions that I ever went on, the training that we went through prior to that was much harder. I mean, when real bullets are flying and real people are dying, that's a different scenario. But you're at least prepared for absolute chaos. And you start, you start very slow. You start, you know, the sort of the crawl, walk, run. But you build up to just absolute chaos. Everything went wrong. And then you still have to problem solve and figure out how to get out of it. Uh, that's awesome. I, you know, getting back to Chris Cassidy one more time, I, um, he gave me this analogy. He goes, the SEAL teams were great at preparing me to be an astronaut because you learned to just do your job as if it was second nature. He goes, I knew exactly what each one of my teammates was going to do. And it got to a point where I didn't even have to look at them because I instinctively knew they were going to take care of what they needed to. And he said he had a spacewalk where the astronaut he was doing the spacewalk with had condensation start building up in the helmet and it became almost a life and death situation. And he goes, I have no idea how I grabbed him, how I managed while I was holding him to open the door and get him in. He goes, it was just because we had practiced this a thousand times that at that moment, he just, he just did it. And the same is, is in life. Um, right. 
So I, I did want to, uh, I saw that you participated in an event where it was in the Hudson, and it reminds me of something that um, uh, one of your SEAL teammates, uh, Dan O'Shea, started here in Tampa called uh, the Frogman Swim. Now that benefits uh, the, the Navy SEAL community, but I was hoping you could talk about uh, the run swim event that you do as well. So the, the, the event in the Hudson, it, this was the, the third year that, that we've done it. This is the second year that I've done it. I wasn't able to make it the first year, but it's, it's to support what's called the GI Go Fund, GIGO Fund. And that fund is a fund that helps uh, veterans and, and first responders, primarily homeless veterans. Uh, it helps veterans that are transitioning, like we talked about earlier, from the military into civilian life. It helps, you know, they'll pay for different vocational skills. They'll help veterans that want to be entrepreneurs. They'll help with some startup capital and things like that. But, I, you know, again, I, you know, going back to the homeless, vet, home, veterans are a, a large part of our homeless population in the United States, which is absolutely un, unbelievable. But these guys are helping uh, with that. And, and, you know, the other thing that that swim, so, it, so the swim is a fundraiser. So every swimmer gets a, uh, a link so that people can donate and, and support the, the GI Go Fund. Uh, but it's also the swim is also to it, this was the 20th anniversary of 9-11 it's coming up in just, you know, this month. And, you know, it was to to bring remembrance of, of 9-11. It was to bring remembrance of soldiers, SEALs uh, that we've lost in uh, in the war on terror. But it was also to bring awareness to veteran suicide. And, you know, we've we've lost more veterans to suicide at 22 a day. And actually the, the last numbers I've heard is actually 26 a day as of November of 2020. And, you know, so what we would do is we, we did a run, we got in the Hudson River, we swam out to a barge in front of the Statue of Liberty, we climbed out, we did a 22 pull-ups for that, you know, bring awareness to, to veteran suicide, 22 a day, and 100 push-ups. And then we swam to a barge in front of Ellis Island, another 122. And then we swam to Lower Manhattan, uh, ran to the 9-11 Memorial, did another 122, and then we placed flags on the on the memorial. But but really, it was it's it's about it's about raising raising awareness and raising funding for for veterans and first responders, and really again bringing awareness to that 22 a day. Well, what a great cause. And I recently did a, an episode with my friend. Uh, he's a former Marine Corps officer, Chuck Smith. Chuck actually talked about uh, veteran suicide on a TED Talk that's been watched about two and a half million times now. But he and I were trying to bring more attention to it as, as well, because the numbers are pretty staggering. In the 20 years, there have been somewhere in the neighborhood of just north of 5,000 uh, fatalities in, in combat. And with veterans and active service members who've committed suicide, the numbers are somewhere around 145,000. And it's something we really need to do something about. And interestingly enough, I interviewed former Army colonel who's a doctor, uh, Michael Lewis, and they studied when he was at Walter Reed, thousands of suicides, and they found one thing in common, and that was all of them were extremely low on omega-3. And he's like, we could do so much to solve this just by giving more people. It's kind of like your CBD. Not all omega-3 is made the same. So you've got to get high quality. But he said, you just need to slam it in there um, and do it on a regular basis. And it's amazing how much it will improve cognitive, your feelings of depression and other things. So uh, thank you for bringing that up and thank you for doing that charity. If someone was interested in doing that, do you, um, can anyone do this? Do, does it require special training? There's, I mean, it's, about? A, it's about a three mile, three and a half mile swim. I mean, this, I'll tell you that this year was easier than last year because the current last year was pretty terrible. We were swimming, swimming forward, but we were going backwards. Like the, the current was really strong last year. We actually finished about an hour and a half earlier this year than we did the, the following, the previous year. Uh, which was, I was happy about that. Um, so most of the vet, so most of the people that are swimming are, are seals or former seals, but there was a former Olympian, uh, both last year and this year swimmer. And you can, other people can participate, patriots, 
other veterans, first responders. But I think there's a, a some sort of screening test for swimming and being able to do the the physical parts of it. So yes, you can, but uh, you you have to. It's it's pretty strictly. You got to pass a, a screening test before you can actually participate in the event physically. But you can certainly donate to the organization, donate to the cause. That's great. I know when they do the Frogman swim here, they have people who are on kayaks who are paddling next to each swimmer. Um, so there's always a big need for volunteers. Is that similar right. with this event? Uh, no, we had we had NYPD and NJPD, New Jersey PD, all in the because they have uh, they have boats in the river all the time. So what they they had their their boats, they had jet skis, and they had also had people on kayaks who were monitoring the swimmers. They also had helicopters above the head. And so they they really have that kind of lockdown. But I'm sure that if if you reached out to the GI Go Fund, they would uh, certainly point you in a direction to figure out how to the best way to to support or help if you wanted to volunteer. Okay. And I was going to end today's show um, by having you tell one other short story, and that is. I remember when I heard this story, I was thinking back to the 1700s when John Adams and others are creating the Declaration of Independence and other articles for the United States. And you happen to be in the room, I understand it, uh, when the Iraqi government was creating their new constitution. I just, for a listener, that had to be just an amazing, even though you probably couldn't understand what they were talking about, an amazing thing to see them do such a unprecedented an event like that. Right. And so that was a deployment to Iraq in 2005, where our mission was to protect the interim government of Iraq. And it's a mission that no one wants, but it was necessary. It was a no-fail mission. You cannot fail. And I was one of three Americans that got to be in the room while they were writing and signing their, their constitution. And yeah, I mean, we had a, the, the, the interpreter that we had was the other American. And actually, I'm not even sure that he was American or not. So maybe there was only two of us. It was my OIC uh, and, and me as the platoon chief. And we would take turns being in the room uh, with, with our VIP. And so the interpreter would kind of tell us what was, what was going on. And so, yeah, it was kind of cool to be in the room while they were writing and signing uh, the, their constitution and, and how they would reach out to their, and it was, it was kind of eye-opening, like their religion, is written into their constitution because they brought their, you know, guys that we were fighting early on in Iraq. Now we're like escorting them into the room to write, you know, certain things, you know, uh, into their, into their constitution. And, you know, the religious official that showed up, he was a young guy. Uh, he got the most amount of respect of anyone else in the room. And because he was the guy that was really leading and guiding what was going to be put in there. So it was, wow. it was cool to kind of be there and be a part of that, that little bit of history. You were definitely making history when you were there. That's great. And William, thank you so much for being on the show today and sharing so much of your wisdom. I really appreciate sure. it. All right. Thanks for having me again. Thank you for spending the time with us on the Passion Start Podcast. I know you have tons of other places that you could be spending it, but it means so much to us that you are here and that you're part of the show. And if you love today's episode, please share it with growth-minded friends who need a weekly dose of inspiration. If there's a topic you would like me to discuss or a person you would like to see me interview, please DM me on Instagram at John R. Miles. And if you haven't checked it out yet, please go and subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is called John R. Miles as well. We have hundreds of videos on the site and they're categorized in different playlists to make them much more consumable. Topics ranging from overcoming adversity, relationships, health and wellness, peak performance, personal improvement, and so many more. And if you truly loved today's episode, it would mean so much if you gave us a five-star rating for it. Those ratings help so much in helping the show's popularity grow. Thank you, and until next time, be passion struck. Thank you so much for joining us. The purpose of our show is to make passion go viral. And we do that by sharing with you the knowledge and skills that you need to unlock your hidden potential. If you want to hear more, please subscribe to the Passion Struck Podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts at. 
And if you absolutely love this episode, we'd appreciate a five-star rating on iTunes and you sharing it with three of your most growth-minded friends so they can post it as well to their social accounts and help us grow our Passion Start community. If you'd like to learn more about the show and our mission, you can go to passionstruck.com where you can sign up for our, our newsletter, look at our tools, and also download the show notes for today's episode. Additionally, you can listen to us every Tuesday and Friday for even more inspiring content. And remember, make a choice, work hard, and step into your sharp edges. Thank you again for joining us. 